Strucken. Carl Strucken. Now, uh, it would be remiss to not say that uh, most of these people, probably the number one thing you're recognized for would be Adam's family. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, probably. Prob yeah. I mean, you got to spend time with not only one Adam's family, but you got a second Adam's family as well because you came back for Adam's family reunion as well. Yeah, that a was a uh, little talked about film. <laughs> that, that was kind of the, the, the third one, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which was supposed to be a pilot, and uh, so it, it was a pilot, and then the, the rest I wasn't involved with. They went to Canada and they did the rest, I think. Oh, really? So yeah. you, you didn't, they didn't ask you, or you didn't decide to move on, or? Uh, they were going to shoot it all in Canada, and, and I think they used mostly Canadian actors. Or Makes so. sense. Yeah. Uh, how how did you go? How did did they see you and go? Well, that's obviously Lurch. Or did, were you contacted? Did you send photos in? Was there an audition process? No, I, I didn't even have a uh, agent yet. Is this working? Yeah. Yes. Um, so what happened was I got a call and. Um, I met with uh, Scott Rudin, the producer, and Barry Sonnefeld, and uh, it was just the three of us in a room, and they said, well, you know, uh, if you're going to do this, then that's what you're going to be for the rest of your life. <laughs> and uh, I said, I, I've been living in Hollywood for, I, I was, have been living there for 15 years or so. And I said, people keep walking up to me and saying, oh, you're Lurch, right? And then I, I say no, and then they get mad at me because uh, they think I'm just trying to be evasive or something. Uh, so actually, it will be a relief. And uh, so that was it. That was, uh, so you basically, since you were recognized as Lurch anyway, you're like, well, might as well play it. It's yeah, about time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. Uh, what were some of your experiences filming that? The, the film, Adam's Family and Adam's Family Value, are so iconic of films and so well known because of bringing a whole new generation into the Adam's Family. And I know that now they've recently announced that they're going to be doing another Adam's Family that uh, is an animated version, oh. uh, film oh. version, is a uh, 3D animated film uh, version, hearkening more back to the comic books, is what I've heard. Oh, I, I, I hope I get to grunt a little bit. In the, in the I, I, I was going to say, have, do you, have you been reached to? Because you no, are no. so iconic yeah. merch for everyone. Yeah, well, um, yeah, well, the, 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 uh, I, I know that I think the whole thing got started by Scott Rudin because he was such a, a fan. And I, I think he even as a child, he built uh, the Adams Family mansion from matchsticks or so he so he was a hardcore fan wow and um he wanted to uh stay close to the the, the drawings instead of the tv series um and for barry sonnefeld he had been a uh, director of photography before so this was his first first movie and the very first scene that we were going to shoot, the very first day, uh, I had done my makeup and I walk into the uh, sound stage and somebody gets carried out on a stretcher. <laughs> it was Barry Sonnefeld because he had fainted because he was so nervous about doing it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I've never heard of him. That is awesome. Yeah, oh, maybe I'm telling something I'm not supposed to, but... Uh, we'll keep it between us, no one... Yeah, yeah. Everybody, he, we're okay? He, 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 I mean, he, he did a fantastic job, so I, I don't think it's anything uh, against him. Uh, and he became a very successful uh, movie director and producer afterwards. Uh, I wonder if he's still fainting on set, though. <laughs> no, now he's he's very uh, self-assured. Uh, yeah, uh, that that happened 
very quickly in the process. Uh. <laughs> now, uh, I'm, I'm a bit of an older generation, so anybody in here who is a little older may have remembered seeing you for the first time in a, a film called Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> uh, a, a, a film that I think that's the most amount of applause it's ever gotten. <laughs> uh, right there, thank you for that. Uh, but uh, how did, was, was that your first role, or was that one of the early, that was one of your earlier roles, correct? Yeah, I, I also, I, I did some uh, kind of monster in the woods, uh, but I, I forget, I don't know if it was before or after Sgt. Pepper, but um, yeah, I, I used to live in, in Hollywood, and, and people would walk up to me in the supermarket and say, we want, we, we're working on this movie, and so I, I did a few kind of things that I never, that I've never even seen afterwards, but um, um, now is that, I, I think it was the first big, yeah. Big is movie. that true? The, the story that I've heard was very much like what you just said with how you got cast in Sgt. Pepper's. Can you share that? Yeah, I, I used to go, living in Hollywood, I used to go to the to a movie theater on Hollywood Boulevard. And I'm, I'm cheap, so I, I, I would always park on the street and have to walk for a while. And uh, I went around the corner from Vine and Hollywood, and apparently, I didn't know that, uh, but apparently in the 30s and 40s and so on, uh, actors would hang out on that corner in the hope of being discovered. And I had no such ambition at that point in time. Uh, I actually had a, a production company and we had a sound stage, so I was doing completely different kinds of things. And um, this woman, uh, and it was rush hour, so the Hollywood Boulevard was just completely uh, standing still. And this woman uh, jumps out of her car abandons her car in the middle of Hollywood Boulevard and walks up to me and says, we need you. Uh, so that was for uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band with the Bee Gees. Now, yeah. sergeants, you're listed as brute. Yeah. The next time that I visibly remember seeing who is this guy, you're playing a character that is credited as, as Giant or The Giant in a small TV show some people have heard of called Twin Peaks. Right. How did that come about? Um, that was, uh, I, I was a big fan myself, uh, so I'd been watching the, the first uh, Season, I guess. Yeah, it was this? I came on in the second, second season. Yeah, or second, whatever. Um, and I just got a call, and I thought, oh, I, I cannot blow this. So I actually, for the first time in my life, I, I, I got an acting coach and everything. I, I thought I'm going to do this for real now. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I met with uh, David Frost. Uh, uh, or not, not, not David. Fro is it David? David Frost? Lynch, yeah. Mark Frost. Mark Frost. Yeah, I met, met with Mark Frost and the casting director, and David wasn't there. And uh, yeah, it was just a little talk, and that was it. And then the first time on the set, David was directing that particular episode, and uh, he walks up to me and said, "Everything is going to be peachy keen." <laughs> and I'd never. It sounded so 50s to me. I'd never heard, of, heard that expression. And uh, that was it. So I, I did my first scene. And we, the, the main instruction we got was that we had to talk and walk very slowly. And uh, so I did that. And then he cut and he walked up to us to uh, Hank, the, the Butler, right? Or the, yeah, Butler. And um, I mean, he said, you know what you were doing there? I want you to do it a lot slower. And I, I was getting nervous because I thought this is the first uh, 
the first episode of the second season, people are going to switch to another channel. Uh, so, but anyhow, we did it, and, and yeah. Now, I've heard lots of stories about uh, David Lynch and uh, the fact that very much a perfectionist as far as how many takes and how how many times to do a scene is that is, is was that your experience with that there was was there a lot of redoing of the same thing for you yeah and I think they were still using film then and um, I've done a few uh, little low budget movies myself so film that's you're, you're constantly in a panic that you're going to either roll, uh, run out of film or just not be able to afford more film. And he, he would take his time. I mean, let that film just roll and roll and roll. And uh, the, the very first shot he wanted to take from really low to the ground, so he wanted to look up at me. Uh, the camera to look up at me. Because he needed you to appear even taller somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and they, but we, were, we weren't shooting on a regular, on a regular sound stage. You can just kind of uh, cut a hole in the floor and, and have the camera lower than the floor. But we couldn't do that because we were shooting it in a uh, kind of an industrial building. A warehouse or something, and uh, so the the cameraman said, "Well, I, I need a very special prismatic setup for that, uh, and we have to get that." So he said, "Okay," and uh, we just waited for two or three hours to get that prism, and we just stopping. A, a movie, a shoot for two hours uh, will drive any producer crazy because it's just uh, the cash register keeps I've, I've ticking, never heard you know? anything so David Lynch though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it just has to be the way he wants it to be and um, so yeah, that's how it goes. Uh, some of your other credits, I, I, there's a word that we notice quite often uh, in some of your IMD, IMDb uh, listings. St. Elsewhere, you were on an episode of St. Elsewhere as The Giant, oddly enough. Um, Charmed, you were on an episode or two of Charmed as, oddly enough, The Giant Demon. So uh, what is it, is it, for you, is it more along the lines of that the, the typecasting, per se, because of your look, is what has completely made your career and you're happy about it? Or have you ever wanted to go, I just, I want to play the romantic lead. I want to play, have you ever gone that route that you're like, I'd like to play the hero piece. I'd like to, is that, or you just mm. steered directly into, this is how I am, this is what I'm doing. Yeah, I, I, I mean, this whole giant thing, uh, but I, 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 I like, uh, I would never want to do the lead. First of all, I'm not good enough for it. But secondly, <laughs> I just like uh, character roles more. Um, I was up for Princess Bride, and um, uh, uh, what's his name, the director? Um, uh, Rob Reiner. Yeah, he, he actually thought I, I, had, uh, I had a future as a comedic actor. I thought, oh, that would be that should be so great, but I, I, I was already kind of half committed to uh, Witches of Eastwick, and uh, and Andre, the giant, was much more suited to the role anyhow. Uh, but it, it it would have been fun to to do some comedy, I think. Oh, I think uh, you would have been excellent at comedy. Yeah, so, uh, uh, I read. Uh, that when you were younger, uh, you got into composing. Or is that a passion of yours that you're still doing as far as music is concerned? No, no, no I, I just haven't gotten around to it. We have a piano sitting in the living room and it's kind of a, this, every, th every time I walk by it, I, I feel kind of guilty for not, uh, <laughs> so yeah, one day, 
the, the piano piece from uh, Witches of Eastwick was something I uh, came up with when I was 15, and my parents were living in uh, Curacao in the Caribbean, and all of a sudden my dad said, okay, we're moving to Holland, uh, which was a bit of a shock for me. And uh, so I thought, I, I have to take something with me. So then I started coming up with this piano piece, which is kind of in the style of music they play there in Curacao. And uh, yeah, that was it. And you, you brought up Witches of Eastwick a couple of times. I'd like to hear any of the stories that you have as far as the filming of that. I know you did, that was up and down the whole East Coast, wasn't it? There was a lot of, there was a few different location sites. Was that a film site that was on the move for you or? Yeah, well, we were um, kind of uh, stationed in, in Boston. And uh, yeah, then the, the whole thing would just move. And it was a huge production. Uh, would move to upstate, uh, um, let's see, where, where were we in? Uh, well, we were in two or three different states, actually, so shooting up. And I don't really know if we made it to Maine, but we were close to Maine also. And uh, yeah, we would just take over a little town or something and uh, start shooting, yeah. Just take over the entire thing. Yeah. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? I don't want to hog up all the questions. Yes? So, big, big fan of Twin Peaks, and, and especially the new season, which was wonderful, so nervous about. But you read about David Lynch's process, and it sounds like he's really kind of loose and sort of trying to find the scene and a lot of impro improvisation. Can you talk about that process and, and how it was with you when you were working with David? Yeah, well, um, I think he always he always knows what he wants, but it it definitely crystallizes at the moment that he's shooting, um, and uh, I never got to see a script because they were so secretive about everything. I think Kyle got a, got a script and uh, a few other of the more main characters, but nobody else knew what they were doing. And even the, the dialogue, which I had to learn to speak backwards, uh, was handed to me on little scribbled pieces of paper uh, just before we were uh, about to shoot the scene. So uh, one scene, the dialogue was a whole paragraph, but I, I had to learn to do everything backwards. So I get this paragraph and I, I thought, I'm, you want me to do this now? Everybody's waiting. So I said, no, you better take a lunch break and uh, have me <laughs> work on that. <laughs> and uh, well, that's what we did, so. Uh, as far as the, the speaking backwards, is that, as an actor, is that something that you, since you've had to do that so many times, is that something that you find yourself able to do now? No, you don't get used to it. The, the <laughs> first time, the first time around, uh, uh, Lil Mike, he uh, sort of the little person in yes. the red in the red room, right? Um, he he had a natural talent for it, so you could say anything to him, and he instantly, without thinking, he would say it backwards. So he he was our uh, backward speaking coach. Um, on that strange long night uh, when we were shooting the final episode. Uh, where there was no script, um, where there were people, there was one guy walking around with a beautiful wooden uh, little business size uh, case um, with hundreds of colored contact lenses in it. And he would walk up to, every, to, to the actors who were sitting there waiting, having no idea what we were gonna do. And he would look us in the eye and look at his lenses, and, <laughs> um, and so there were all these things going on, um, and we, we just shot through the night till it, it was daylight when we were finished, and uh, yeah, that was how it was. How last. long of a shoot was that? I don't know, it was a long, long shoot, it was, but it was, it was fun, it was great, because 
Well, I mean, you know that you were making history, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what it, between Lurch of Adam's family, which I think, the judging from the age, the majority of the people in this room probably grew up watching, and then Twin Peaks, which an iconic television series, and you have an amazing role in that, and then you come on to probably one of the most iconic, long-lasting series of all time, Star Trek The Next Generation, as a character, Mr. Home. Between these three, what is the most amount of like fan interaction? Who is it the Adams Family kids that grow up to you and go, Lurch, or is it the Star Trek, forgive me if this is a dirty word, Trekkies, that come up to you, or is it the Twin Peaks fans that come up? At, who comes up to you the most often? Um, well, just on the streets, so to speak, it's yeah. uh, uh, the Adams family. But uh, the Twin Peaks, uh, I mean, uh, the Star Trek fans are, are much more organized. So. <laughs> Uh, That's a wonderful way to put that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you said uh, you were good at comedy, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so they they have their big conventions, and and doing Star Trek was a, a lot of fun because I, I would come on come on once a year with Majel, and uh, so you, you, it was like coming back to to. People and you got to know them better and better. N not that well because it was only once a year. But um, and it, w what I noticed was that the 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 cast got rowdier and rowdier. And the last season was like a being on a school outing, and the director would say, "Oh, please, guys, come on, let's let's shoot this," <laughs> because they were always joking around still being very professional as soon as the director really wanted to start they would start but uh, who yeah. was the worst joking around of that group uh well um uh what's his name um the second in command uh, jonathan yeah Franks. Uh, he, he was yeah yeah I, anybody surprised on that one <laughs> uh, uh so uh do we do we have trekkies or Trekkers, I'm sorry, I don't remember what we like to be called now. I'm old, I'm Trekkie, Trek so I've got no problem with being a Trekkie. So, uh, uh, you remember the scene with the giant bottle of Romulan ale? Great. So, the, the idea that, as a performer myself, I've had to do something close to that with this size bottle. How in the world is that something? Is that a skill that you just have? Can you just take a giant? This is this was a larger than a wine bottle, and you tipped it back. Was that one take? Was that a effect? What, how did you do that? Um, well, the, the, this this was Hollywood, so uh, they they have their ways. And uh, in this case, it was a, uh, a bottle with a, a double walled bottle. Oh, okay. But they, they shoot it about 20 times, right? So they still had a, a clear path for me to the, to the bathroom uh, <laughs> laid out. <laughs> to make sure you get there. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, is there a role in your career uh, besides uh, Lurch that you feel because I've, I've read in several instances that one of the most proud of Farah's character is because of how long-lasting Lurch has been and the fact that you've had families grow up with Lurch, where there were kids that were watching Adam's Family, the movie, that now are bringing their kids to conventions uh -huh. to introduce. Uh -huh. Is there a role other than Lurch that you feel best speaks you, that is best representative of you? Um, of me? Wow. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I really, really enjoyed uh, being in Star Trek, um, um, and I am a big fan of David Lynch. So that was also just fantastic to be in. So it's it's hard to say. I mean, they all, all these things that I've been lucky enough to be in, 
uh, have been special for their own reason. So. Do we, I saw another hand earlier when I asked for other questions. Yeah, because of, of course, while we were shooting, I didn't get to see that golden globe. <laughs> um, so, but I, I, I had the sense that it was something really important. Uh, so, and, and uh, I, well, the, the, we were instructed time and time again, and we got emails, and, and we, we got told on the set uh, that we couldn't say anything about anything and well I didn't even know what was going on so <laughs> that was easy enough but then I went to a convention in um, in Brussels and they they asked me what what kind of part I had I said well I, I, I can't talk about it um, because we are sworn to secrecy, but I, I think I'm some kind of a god. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, did I get, did I get to hear about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so it, I, I had the feeling that it was a, a very important moment uh, in the history of the world, not just Twin Peaks. Um, and, but that was about it. <laughs> What was the phone call like when you, f and did you find out about the revival season? Did you find about the new season before? Or did you find out just as you were, hey, we want you back? Did, how was that conversation? Uh, no, I just knew that uh, there was this whole struggle going on that David Lynch only wanted to do the series if he could do it his way, and then uh, the, uh, what was it, uh, who's, who, who was producing it? Mark Frost? No, no, the... Oh, the, the newer season. Uh, the Showtime, Showtime yeah. Thank you. Showtime not wanting to put that kind of money in, and so he actually uh, started a little tweet, uh, tweet war with uh, Comcast. No, not Showtime. Comcast. Showtime, yeah. yeah. With Showtime, uh, saying, "Well, I, 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 I have to cancel because it, it's not going to be the way I want it to be." And then, um, so it was the first, as far as I know, it was the first uh, negotiation process uh, via tweets, <laughs> uh, and he got his way. And, Negotiating uh, 104 char 40 characters at a time. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They could have just sent you to the Showtime office. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't you hear? He's a god of some sort. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, other questions? Sorry. I'd love to hear any Star Trek anecdotes that you have about working on the set with Patrick Stewart and Rachel Barrett. I, I don't have any real anecdotes. I mean, the, the, you've seen the blooper reels, right? So. There was a lot of walking into doors that wouldn't open at the right time, and, uh, <clears throat> and it was just yeah, it was always fun to to be there, and uh, but nothing went seriously wrong. Uh, it, it was fun to to uh, like when when the the starship gets hit by something and every everybody goes like this. It, it was just surprising to see how well they could do that. I mean, they were, it was it had become second nature, you know? So you get hit and you see everybody do this, and I thought, wow, that's uh, very convincing. <laughs> so, but I, yeah, I don't have any real anecdotes. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, uh, and, and the suitcase and a few of those, yeah. I saw another hand. Yes. Yep, that'd be you. Uh, when you researched the, uh, when you got the role for Search, uh, did you ever watch the original Adam Sandler to uh, try to get it? Uh, no, uh, I, we, we, we got a big stack of uh, all the, um, the, dro the, the comic uh, comics, and that was the main inspiration. And it wasn't, it wasn't on right now. There, there were, were no reruns of the Adams Family, uh, as far as I know. Oh, at the uh, time? I didn't know that, yeah. At that time, yeah. Uh, I saw one, there we go. Uh, not for the lurch sheets, but I, 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 it, it was a little bit disturbing on Star Trek that I got so little to say. So um, I, there I definitely especially became, because we came from a planet where we uh, could talk um, uh, telepathically. telepathically. I heard uh, you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, so I, I always imagined having a long uh, discussions with Majel um, uh, about everything and um, then I also remember there was one scene where I had to fit a dress with needles and I for some reason I was particularly miffed at that moment that I had no dialogue in that episode so I thought okay I'm gonna stick all these pins in my mouth and then at least there's a reason why I'm not saying anything <laughs> And so, yeah, that was... Okay. Now, uh, recently, anybody who has a Netflix subscription also will notice that you showed up in Gerald's game. Yeah. Uh, what was it like working on a Stephen King script, of all things? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, finally, right? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> That how did it take so long is basically yeah. what I need to know. It's the, yeah, they, exactly. They've never found another Stephen King role for you? Right, yeah, that's, that was strange. But uh, yeah, that was a, a pretty uh, involved uh, part with uh, four hours of makeup. And um, yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting. In Mobile, Alabama. <laughs> four uh, hours of makeup in Alabama. Yeah. And, when and was the filming? Uh, was it August in Alabama? Where no, no, it wasn't. Okay. It wasn't too hot. No, okay, but it good. Was just uh, it's it's just a little bit strange to be in Alabama. But uh, <laughs> uh, anybody who's ever been to Alabama will agree with you. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think we have time. One last question. Anybody? Uh, well, they, they started out with uh, using all these prosthetics on me, and uh, then uh, Angelica Houston's, uh, she, Angelica had a, her own private makeup person, and uh, she saw them working on me, and she said, no, 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 I, I, I'll take care of that, and she just walked in with a, a few little brushes and stuff, and she went, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if everybody can please, round of applause for Mr. Charles Kruggen. <laughs> Thank you on behalf of Sinister Creature Con for you being here. Please make sure you can keep that applause going by going by his table and supporting him so we can make sure we get him back for more conventions. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.